Welcome everybody to our Bay Area Real Estate Town Hall Q&A. This is our third week um, since our shelter in place in California. Uh, a lot of people have been stuck at home, but at the same time, we're all wondering what is going on. As you know, the first week, literally regulations, laws been changing every single day and uh, everything is just so fluid. And so we have to constantly do a lot of research to find out information so that we can advise our clients accordingly. And um, this is why I'm very excited about um, today's, today's speakers because we have some hot topics every single week. Um, so I would love to use this opportunity to share information with you guys. And this town hall, uh, again, I want to make sure everybody understands that you know, this is the purpose of this is to solve the problem between um, consumers and local real estate industry. I see this information gap between us. So this is allowing um, our consumers to directly ask questions to a group of real estate professionals. This is not going to be just me, but it's going to be everybody's input. So I'm very excited to be able to connect everyone here. And the solutions, of course, is to provide education and then also sharing from um, all the different real estate professionals and empower our consumers especially during these difficult times because i think not knowing is the scariest time and by understanding and talking to other professionals that will ease some of these worries around, um, around this pandemic every week we have some different hot topics this week obviously we have uh, a lot of topics about stimulus packages especially the sba loans just rolled out the paycheck protection Pro program we call it ppp or the Economic Injury Disasters Loan, we call it EIDL. And also last night, I was up, a lot of us actually, was up until midnight to listen to the uh, San Jose City Council meeting that lasted 10 and a half hours because um, they, had, they had proposed this emergency rent susp suspension for tenants. Um, so I'm sure I'll, some people would love to talk about that. And then of course, how do we show properties nowadays? How do we see it? Uh, are there still offers um, coming in? So we're gonna touch base on a lot of these different topics. So I want to introduce our very first guest, Vincente Lopez, and he is the relationship manager from First Bank. And he actually has been working a lot of the um, PPP application right now. But if you don't mind, Vincente, right now, can you just do a short intro and also maybe a couple, a, a couple comments about what you see Currently, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, um, Vicente Lopez with First Bank. Uh, so I work for a family-owned bank. Uh, we're about six billion in assets, and our primary focus has been uh, family-owned businesses. Uh, we were very—I was very fortunate to to hear that uh, we had a task force involved in uh, putting together a process for the PPP loan. Uh, they started last Monday and by Wednesday we had a process down and it's kind of been changing as it goes along but uh, we're very happy to report that we are processing we are getting SBA loan numbers and then right now we're just kind of working on getting final guidance to that final step to fund accounts um, First Bank is Missouri based uh, and we have presence in Missouri California Illinois and Texas uh, I, I work out of Northern California and cover all of Northern California, but we have branches throughout the uh, state of California. Great, thank you. And um, and the next guest we have Tim Tukalski, and uh, Tim Tukalski is actually he's also a CCIM just like me, and but he has he's a CPA with forty years of experience. And currently, he's working for Sensiba San Filippo um, and leading the uh, firm's real estate and construction group. And Tim, he's also currently serving as the secretary and treasurer for the Northern California chapter CSIM. So, Tim, do you have a few words to maybe do a little bit more intro and also talk about the current situation? Sure. Thanks, Helen. And thanks for inviting me to this. Um, so, I have mentioned a couple of times on some other webinars that. Uh, literally 100% of my time has been consumed in the last two weeks talking to clients about what to do, um, not only from tax standpoints, but from the, uh, the PPP application 
uh, whether their business qualifies, uh, you know, what type of loan should they get, what kind of documentation do they need to provide. Um, so it's been uh, a whirlwind of information. You know, we just came off of a, a busy season last year with the TCGA, you know, uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, um, which I spent hundreds of hours learning that. And now it seems like I've got to spend hundreds of hours unlearning that or modifying it because a lot of the tax provisions that were brought on by the TCGA have been changed dramatically. Uh, most or well, for the good, actually. Um, so uh, it's a it's an interesting time, an exciting time. Um, I think it's a time of opportunity and and a, a time of uh, you know great upheaval. So I want to just get out there with the information as much as I can with people. We're learning as uh, we go along. I'm sure you're getting bombarded with information, mm -hmm. um, some good, some bad. So yeah. Hit us with the questions. Exactly. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. Especially as a matter of fact, last week we had some tax question, and I was like, "Oh, I wish Tim Tukowski was on the call." <laughs> so I'm very excited to have you here. Thank and you. I so may not have known the answer, but anyway, <laughs> I can I can fake it. Yeah. <laughs> and our third guest is Kurt Whipple. Uh, Kurt, actually, um, as a matter of fact, I met him from this uh, from the Forbes Speakers platform. And uh, the first time I heard him spoke, I was like, oh my God, he literally blew everybody away with the information that he had. He is a, um, a national recognized speaker. He is also a published author and you had published two books, correct? Three, actually. Three books. Yeah. I see. And also he is actually a retired financial advisor, but he is now coaching other financial advisors. He was um, interviewed by a lot of different media channels, including Fox, CBS, USA Today. So I cannot uh, say how, how honored I am to have you on here. Thank you so much, Kurt. And would you mind to do a little bit more intro and also give your comments as well? I'd be happy to. And thank you first and foremost for having me, Helen. It's always a privilege and opportunity to share into other people's lives and have some kind of an impact. And hopefully I'll be able to do that today. Um, yeah, I spent 33 years running my own practice, kind of started from the ground up working in my basement under a bare light bulb with a phone and calling out of the phone book prospecting for people who wanted to do financial planning. And uh, was very blessed to have built a very sizable financial firm uh, and uh, an income of about 2.7 million a year. And uh, last year I sold the firm and have spent all my time coaching financial advisors, as you said. Uh, as far as the market goes going forward from here, <clears throat> this is one of those times where there's nothing in history that I can look back on and say, well, based on historical blah, 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 you know, here's what I would accept the market's going to do in the future. But just, just very briefly, if I had to take a guess, which is purely a guess, I really do believe we're going to have some kind of a run up in the market. Certainly not back to, I don't think we're going to bounce right back to 30,000 in the Dow. Uh, but I do think there'll be a run-up of summertime rally, uh, probably uh, somewhat a little bit here throughout the month of April, May, but mostly in June, July, and August. Uh, and then I think we're going to be set for another volatile situation uh, because the ele you will, you'll have the election coming up. And in addition to the election, then when November hits, October, November, I think we're going to see Corona pop up again. Uh, maybe not as bad, obviously, but uh, it'll pop up again. And as everybody knows, the news media really likes to expand upon that because it, it definitely captures viewers. So uh, I think this year is going to be a pretty shaky year market-wise. I'm not sure it's going to be profitable. Uh, I do believe that uh, we will come back eventually. We always do. Uh, but who can say nowadays? I've never been in this myself over my career. So... <laughs> we'll, we'll see if my prognostication is anywhere close to correct. <laughs> well, we sure hope that the coronavirus, we can get some kind of handle by end of the year and also everybody learn how to handle it. I think right now, just everyone was kind of like, okay, no one is an expert on this. So um, right. and hence again, we have this town hall to share information. So I'm gonna go into start asking questions that I want to remind everybody again is that Feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A box. 
And also, uh, uh, feel free to you know raise your hand if you feel like, hey, I have some more information I would like to share as a professional. Um, you can raise your hand and let us know that you would like to make some comments, and I'll unmute you, or you can unmute yourself. So um, let's start with the first question. First question is, what is the difference between economic injury disaster loan from SBA and the Paycheck Protection Loan from CARES Act? Um, I assume maybe Vincente, you can talk about it, or Tim Tukowski, you can talk about it. I, I would defer to Vincente first, but uh, since he's probably dealt with it. Yeah, well, the, so the PPP program uh, is what we're implementing as a bank. And it's essentially a, uh, a factor of two and a half times a monthly payroll. Mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that That's how you come to the loan amount. So basically, we're going to look back a year. We're going to get that average payroll amount, multiply that by two and a half. And that's the amount of loan that you're eligible for. Um, as far as the economic disaster program, there's some different stipulations there. I'm a little less versed on that, but from what I understand, it can be used for debt service. It can be used for a variety of items, but you can't use the disaster loan for all and apply for the payroll loan and basically cross mingle funds. But at the end of the day, um, it's pretty simple. I think the, the PPP program is just to cover your payroll. The disaster loan is for, for the other, the other item of, areas of your business that have been affected by the by the virus sure uh well again i have some limited knowledge in this but my understanding is that the the idle program has been around for a while so it's an established sba program it's much smaller than the ppa ppp uh it's, it's a ten thousand uh, dollar grant really um and uh i believe that you can apply for both uh, but the amount that you get under the idol will reduce your PPP. Um, in a sense, my understanding is that the PPP serves as almost a refinance of the idol and then could actually then be eligible for the debt forgiveness if the proceeds are used for uh, the designated things like payroll, mortgage interest, rents, that type of thing. Well, um, I know Oh, sorry. And I know that in the PPP um, application, it actually did ask if you have ever, I think it's apply for the IDLE or if you have been granted money from IDLE, correct, Vincente? That is right. So they are, they are looking at that. They want to make sure that you're not basically using the funds for the same thing, uh, requesting, essentially requesting payroll money from the IDLE program and then PPP and then using them for the, they want to make sure that you're, you're separating the two uh, uses. Yeah, and uh, I, I know that um, IDLE is probably mostly um, uh, processed by SBA uh, lenders. So if, for example, I think Stephanie, you have done a lot of SBA loans before. Yeah, if so, um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yes. So for the uh, IDLE program, you apply directly with SBA. So you go on sba.gov, um, slash disaster to apply for this loan. Um, the rate is 3.75% and for nonprofits is 2.75%. Um, the maximum loan amount is 2 million and you do get a $10,000 grant. It's full recourse. Um, you need to guarantee additional collateral is needed and you'll have automatic deferments until December 31st. And um, like Tim was saying, you can apply for the idle and PPP, um, you would refinance your idle loan into the PPP program. And the $10,000 grant that you receive with the idle program, um, that will be taken out of the, the amount forgiven under the PPP program. Got it, great. Um, now, some banks the, uh, don't seem to know anything about the PPP. Uh, are there any guidelines given to particular banks so we know where to go to find um, as your primary choice? Um, right. I would go to a bank that you currently bank with. Um, First Bank, so Vicente's Bank's actually taking non-customers, non-bank customers to help them out. Is that correct, Stella Vicente? Yeah, we are. The, the process is, uh, is a little more difficult because we do have to collect uh, 
historical financials. So one thing that's happening is we still need to adhere to all banking policies, KYC, know your client. Uh, so that's why it's easier for banks to say we're only processing existing clients because you've already gone through the background checks and all the BSA requirements. Uh, that being said, we are taking new clients, but we, we kind of have to collect the whole package, which means three years of financials, um, all the entity information, make sure we have driver's licenses, signers, the whole thing. So it makes it a little bit more, more time consuming. Uh, but we are doing it and it, you just have to be patient and quite honestly, you have to understand that you're probably going to be um, second in line first to the existing clients. We want to make sure that we take care of them and then, uh, and then we'll go to the non, non-existing clients. Hmm. Um, does the PPP allow small business to count 1099 employee as part of the payroll? No, the 1099 employee would have to apply themselves for the PPP program. Oh, so it's the PPP program, which it starts at April 10th, correct? That's correct. That's, yeah. Yeah. So if you are, so a lot of real estate uh, uh, agents, they are independent contractor, they don't have a corporation, and they don't have payroll, then they need to apply on April 10th, assuming that the fund is still there. Um, I think I saw on the news yesterday, they are trying to ask for more funds because uh, Wells Fargo had put out a news saying that they have already exhausted all the funds. I'm not sure if that's correct because on the same night, I saw a Wells Fargo contact told me that they have not even opened up the application process yet. Um, so, so again, banks may not even know how to, how to handle this at this time. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think basically what happened with uh, with Wells was they capped the amount that they were going to do based on restriction from the uh, from the regulators as to their growth, but mm -hmm. those caps were released today. So it, it has created a frenzy out there mm -hmm. with a lot of the existing Wells clients, um, which is why this uh, non-client uh, aspect of the program came up to banks because you have a lot of banks. Uh, that aren't participating. However, you do have a lot of banks that are. And so that's where it makes sense to go to your existing bank first to see if they're participating um, and what their process and timeline is. Yeah. Got it. Um, Toss B asked, will there be a hard or soft credit pull on these? The PPP program is unsecured. Uh, we're just for non-clients we're just making sure we do our background checks to make sure that they don't show up on OFAC uh, but the, you know it's unsecured there's no guarantees uh, no personal guarantees there's a hundred percent government guarantee uh, so no there won't be any credit checks pulled. Got it. Got it. My understanding though is that there is there is a criminal background check that is done on all 20 percent owners of the business um, and uh, if you're convicted of a felony within the last five years, uh, you or your 20% owner, you won't get the loan. Okay. Um, let me move on to uh, some tax question. What tax benefits do I not get if I apply for the loan? Well, the, the, the two benefits that you don't get are the employee, the employee tax credit or employment tax credit. Uh, that's the credit that gives you 50% of a employee's wages up to $10,000 uh, for payments made after March 21st through December of this year. Um, if you go for the PPP loan, uh, you won't qualify for that. But, you know, what's better, getting a loan <laughs> that's going to be forgiven uh, versus a refundable credit and it's the maximum 5,000 per employee. I think it's uh, the math is probably pretty easy on that. The other one is the deferment of the uh, employer's portion of the payroll taxes. So as we all know, when you pay employees, they have to pay 50% out of their pocket or their payment and the employer pays the other 50%. That 50% uh, will still be due, but will be deferred. 50% of it will be due the end of, of uh, 2021, if 
I remember right. And the other 50% will be due the end of 2022. Oh. So uh, again, if you go for the PPP, you won't get that, but uh, much better to be forgiven a loan within eight weeks than it is to have to not have to pay payroll taxes for two years, I think. Yeah. Well, um, now forgiven, when you said forgiven, is that uh, I believe that you still have to, re so technically speaking, you have to request to be forgiven, correct? Well, what you have to do, and I'll let the SBA people chime in here, but I believe that you have to demonstrate to the bank within eight weeks after funding that you use the loan proceeds for the designated uh, categories of expenses, primarily payroll uh, and, and benefits, uh, in mortgage interest, rent, and other debts, which I've yet to see what that has been uh, uh, defined as. Uh, the latter, though, has to be uh, less than 25% or, or less of the total loan proceeds in order to be forgiven. So 75% um, or more needs to be spent on uh, payroll. Got it. Okay. Um, now, what type of benefits do I get regardless of whether I get the loan or not? So there were some some major changes. Like I said, you know, I spent a lot of time learning the the uh, the new law under the TCGA, and some of those provisions were reversed or suspended. So one was the uh, the interest limitation. So uh, uh, the deduction, interest deduction limitation, uh, under the TCGA, uh, you were limited to if you were a uh, disqualified business, which could be a tax shelter, uh, more than 35% of your losses allocated to limited entrepreneurs, then you were going to be limited on your interest deduction to 30% of which was uh, approximately equivalent to EBITDA. Uh, that limitation now has been raised to 50% um, for uh, 2019 tax returns. Um, so that one you get regardless of whether you were under the PPP or not. Um, the other one, which you're getting a lot of press on, uh, especially on CNN, is the relief for the rich. This is the one that says that no longer will, or at least for 2018, 2019, and 2020, uh, previously losses that were generated from businesses that exceeded $500,000 uh, were going to be limited to uh, the 500000 on a joint return, two fifty on individual. So the play here is that the advantages you get from owning real estate, uh, we're getting a lot of feedback, I think. I don't know if that's me or do you hear that? Um, but anyway, um, the... Uh, real estate losses that could be generated from accelerating depreciation, uh, doing a cost segregation study, taking bonus depreciation on qualified improvement property, uh, that could easily generate more than $500,000 of losses from a real estate venture. Uh, that limitation now has been lifted. And it's been lifted retroactive back to 2018. Oh. So that means that somebody who uh, and I've got a handful of clients this actually applied to, if they were limited on their 2018 return because of large losses coming from a real estate investment, uh, they were limited to the 500,000. It, it's, it's not elective, it's mandatory to go back to 2018, file an amended return, take 100% of that loss and carry it back five years to get a refund. So uh, that's a major, major provision. Uh, and, and you could say it's a benefit for the rich, but it's also something that they took away in 2018. Uh, so uh, that's interesting. Really that, that yeah, that's a, that's a big one. So that's for example, there, um, do you see any of these can be taken advantage by uh, real estate investors? Obviously, um, a lot of people who invest um, and real estate, uh, especially maybe if they're relying on rental income, um, they might have a pretty big loss this year. So any of these can be taken advantage of? 
Well, w without you know dominating the conversation for the next 15, 20 minutes on what it, what is the definition of a real estate professional? Mm -hmm. Yes, if you uh, are designated as a real estate professional for federal tax purposes and you generate these losses, in other words, you're not a passive investor. Uh, these would be active business losses flowing through on your return. You absolutely will be able to take advantage of these. Um, especially if you did a, a you know, cost segregation study, generated a large amount of depreciation deductions, or you know the technical correction that they did on the QIP property, the, uh, the qualified improvement property. So there was a glitch in the um, 2018 legislation where uh, any interior improvement to a commercial building was supposed to qualify for bonus depreciation, in other words, immediate write-off in 2018, and Congress screwed up. Um, so for over a year, we were debating, are they gonna fix it, are they gonna fix it? Well, they fixed it. So uh, people are now going to be able to either go back, file a minute return for 2018, or take the benefit of that depreciation deduction by filing an accounting method change form 3115 on their 2019 return, and take the benefit there. Oh. I would encourage you though to look at both options because it might be better to amend your 2018 return so that you get the five year carry back. If you, uh, if you don't do that for 2000, uh, uh, if you do it for 2019, um, you know, you'll cut off a year potentially. It so, sounds like just the business alone needs a whole segment on its own. It could, that's why I say I don't wanna, I don't wanna dominate that but it's, uh, you know, it, 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 I, like I said, I'm not exaggerating. I spent 100% of my time talking to clients about the PPP and whether or not they qualify when the tip of the iceberg is all these tax, uh, you know, ramifications. And the fact that, uh, you know, I got to postpone having to file people's tax returns until July 15th, I thought I was going to be on vacation. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, couldn't be farther from the truth. Yeah, I, I know a lot of us is actually working much harder than before. Um, but let me let me jump on to a couple more questions for Kurt, and then uh, I'm going to start uh, asking these questions from the audience as well. Um, the next question is, as most of the people who earn less income currently, what kind of financial planning would you have suggested prior to the pandemic, and what kind of difference would have this made to them during this crisis? Kurt? The, the, it depends on age. There's a number of different factors. The first factor is uh, how far are you away from retirement? Are you in your 30s, 40s, 50s, or 60s? Number two is what's your risk tolerance? So there's a lot of factors that go into that uh, where it's not that simple of a, an answer to give. But I would say this. Let's um, talk about my age then. Yeah, uh, right uh, in the middle. See, if we go back to 25, that might be... Oh, no. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> well, add another 20 years. Okay. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, so anyway, the, the bottom line is, I think for most people, the, the name of the game is you have to diversify. And I don't mean diversify on Wall Street. I've had people come to me where they have $1.4 million, let's say, and then uh, they go through a crash like this. Uh, uh, actually, they had the 1.4 before they came to me. They came to me afterwards and they got 750000 left. And the, quite, the, what I've heard them say is, well, yeah, but my broker said I was diversified. And I said, you were. You were diversified in Wall Street. But the problem is the sinking tide sinks all ships, the rising tide rises all ships. So I would say that the way that you prevent this is by being properly diversified. Obviously, real estate's a big one. I'm a big fan. I've got three properties of my own uh, that I own. So I, I really believe in that uh, very strongly. Uh, the other side of the coin is that you really want to diversify your investments into pre-tax, which would be 401k, IRA, 457, 403bs, whatever. You also want to have non-qualified, and then you want to have tax-free. Um, a lot of people think the only way to do tax-free is with a Roth, and that's not true. Obviously, the Roth, depending on your income, you can be limited severely on what you can contribute to a Roth. So what really surprises people, but many business owners I worked with when I had my firm were shocked by, is that there is a thing called an index universal life policy. You say, well, why in heaven's name would I ever want to put money into a life insurance policy? These policies are phenomenal. Uh, and I don't know, can I share my screen real quick? 
yeah okay let me see it says you cannot share right now oh, sorry I'll, I'll stop sharing on my end okay and then let me you... find what i'm looking for here okay so i'll share this real quick and i apologize for the fuzziness of it uh it's the best i could do in a short period of time so this is an example of an index but i just want to ask if everybody can see his screen right now yes okay great, great. so this is an uh, example of someone who is 50 years of age uh, they decide to put fifty thousand dollars a year in over here on the left into this iul contract the beauty of it is that when they come down here at age 67 they get a $50,737 tax-free income for life. So their total contribution is a quarter million and they get $50,000 tax-free for life. Well, they start off with almost a $1 million life insurance uh, a death benefit. And if you go all the way down to the end of this, there's multi-millions of income with a $250,000 investment over five years. So this all can come out tax-free. So now there's some uh, catches to that. I mean, you have to do it through loans and everything else, but this is all designed for that. Uh, so I recommend people to start to look at this. The other thing is that- I'm sorry, can you repeat what is it called again? It's called an index universal life policy. And so they want to call their uh, insurance agent, uh, highly recommend it be somebody who either does life insurance as a profession or certainly does annuities as a profession. Mm -hmm. uh, most stockbrokers are going to poo-poo this uh, because they don't want you taking your money and putting it in here because they don't get constant fees off of this mm -hmm. for the rest of their uh, their career, right? So is this going to be, let's say, during this crisis, this will be protected? 100% protected. The beauty of this is it's tied to the market. So when the market goes up, you go up. But when the market goes down, you're frozen. Mm -hmm. So you can never go backwards. You can only go up. You can never go down. But the other part, Helen, that's really special about this is let's say that in the example here, at the, uh, at the end of the 10th year, this person has $342,000 in their program and all of a sudden the market crashes. Well, they're still gonna have 342,000 even if the market went down 50%. But here's the key. They now take the 342,000 at the end of the year and they reinvest it where the market's at on your anniversary date. So if the market went down 50% and you never lost a dime, and now you take the 342,000 and the company's reinvesting it at a market drop of 50%, you start earning from the bottom of the market on the whole 342,000 that you never lost. And this was very, very popular with business owners. And the reason why is because uh, you don't have to worry about fairness on it. Uh, there's no federal requirements that if you do it for yourself, you have to do it for your employees. So many business owners, even if they had a 401k plan, would still jump on this and really, really like it because of the fact that it gives them tax-free income. Shh, without because all the people can hear you guys. Nope. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, anyway, so uh, this is one thing, but uh, bottom line is Roth IRAs, uh, I'm a much bigger fan of a Roth than I am of a, a 401k of pre-tax. So Roth IRAs or Roth 401k, uh, index universal life insurance on the tax-free side, and then uh, bottom line, some real estate, and then also some market investments. And the last thing I'll say, and you can go to the next question if you like, is rule of 100 is kind of a rule of thumb in financial planning circles, which basically you take your age, you subtract it from 100, and that is the maximum amount that you should have in Wall Street. So if I'm 50 years old, I want 50% of Wall Street. I want the rest in some form of safer investing like the Index Universal Life or uh, bonds or whatever the case might be. Now bonds right now though, I gotta warn everybody are very, very risky because as interest rates go up, the value of bonds go down, especially bond mutual funds. If you buy an independent bond through a municipality, that's also tax-free. Uh, but municipality income counts toward taxing your social security in retirement. Tax-free income from a Roth and tax-free income from your index universal life policy do not count toward taxing your social security. Mm -hmm. So I've had many people with uh, retired on $100,000 a year of income and they're not paying any income tax on social security and uh, in many cases not paying any income tax at all because they diversified into 
tax-free, pre-tax, and now they can use the money as they see fit. Well, this is this is why you were, uh, I think a lot of people don't know about this. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I feel like this was fascinating. The first time I heard about it, I was like, wow, you know, we need to let more people know. Um, and and I'm not surprised because most of the stockbroker, they're not going to talk about this. Uh, and this would be an alternative uh, for people to hedge against their, you know, uh, something like this, like a market downturn. So um, if, if I can, can I share my screen back? Sure. Do I have to relinquish? Yeah, I'll, I'll stop yeah. sharing. Okay. All right. So let me go back to my screen and then um, I'll, I'll go ahead and start asking a second question. It's, so a lot of our clients put their money, actually you kind of answered that question already. Uh, from what we hear, many financial advisors would advise our clients not to purchase real estate for another year or so. As we know, no one knows when the market will recover. <clears throat> what is your view in terms of real estate investing at this time? When I'm on with a bunch of professional realtors, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand there's some other people. I'm not the pro to ask that question of, right? But I would say this, being that I'm a fan of real estate investing, right now I think the best opportunity going forward is going to be in rental properties uh, as, as a great investment vehicle. That, that's where I'm a big fan of. Um, right now our country is $23 trillion in debt. Uh, we just added $2 trillion of debt through the programs that are coming out of the government right now. We're probably going to have some bailouts and some other things coming along. And right now, the governments, we're spending money like crazy without the ability to pay it. So I expect to see the deficit go up. And a lot of people don't really understand what a trillion means. If you take a trillion seconds on your wristwatch, that's 32,000 years. Now, that's, that's a trillion seconds. <laughs> is 32,000 years. We're 23 trillion in debt, about 25 trillion shortly. And I think we're gonna be pushing up towards 30 trillion in the future. I don't know of any way the government's gonna be able to pay this back, even with a great economy. Uh, and I'm a fan of, of lower taxes and everything else, but I think it's only a matter of time until our tax brackets and our tax rates skyrocket. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, uh, there's been some conversation in Congress about going back to the 1980 tax table. And so let me share with you this because I think it's very, very important for people to understand it. it it's another reason when I hit share screen, nothing came up, a chat oh. came up. You want me to stop sharing? Uh, uh, okay, wait a minute. All right, whoops. Oh, go away. I know financial stuff when I'm not really great at technology, the best. <laughs> Okay, so let me get out of here. Oops. Nope. Ah. Okay, if you bear with me one second, it might be worth it. Sure. <laughs> I, I say it might be worth it. <laughs> uh, hold on. Okay, now I got what I'm looking for. So if you'll hold on one second here. All right, so go back to share screen. It's just hard to share these things without pointing it out on the screen, okay? We all, very visual people. So we yeah, for heaven's sakes, it still got me on the same screen. Why did it do that? Well, before you- Anyway, I'll just say this. I'll, I'll do it without the PowerPoint. Unfortunately, it's so powerful. It would, I think people would really get it. In 1980, the top tax bracket that we had was 70%. If you took a person today who was in the 22% tax bracket, making about $150,000 a year. If you adjusted that for inflation back to 1980, all right, that was $60,000 a year in 1980. And a person making $60,000 a year in 1980 had a 54% tax bracket. Now today, the top tax bracket is 37%. It used to be in 1980, 70%. They've actually stated right on TV, I've heard Congress people state, we need to go back to the 1980 tax table. Oh now, if they do that, and all of a sudden people say, well, today I'm gonna, I think it's roughly around just under $320,000 if you count your standard deductions, you're only in a 24% tax bracket at $300,000. Well, all of a sudden we change to the 1980 tax bracket, you could be looking at a 35, 40, 50% tax bracket so here's what's confusing. People say, well, max out your 401k or your SEP or whatever you've got. 
And I'm sitting there going, okay, so you're taking a tax deduction at today's rates. Now, if you're at 37%, 35, whatever, I understand that. But if you're under $300,000 of income, in my opinion, the index universal life and the Roth is so much better of a way to go because you're getting a deduction at 22 or 24%. And in the future, when this, when this pre-tax money has grown to be worth hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, now all of a sudden you go to take your money out of that 401k. My question is what tax bracket are you going to be in? Yeah, exactly. That's, that is so true. I, I absolutely agree. It's the question is like, we don't know what the tax bracket is going to be when we retire. Right. So right. I, oh my gosh, that, that was powerful. Actually, it was really, that's powerful. why you want to diversify pre-tax, tax-free, non-qualified mm. real estate, etc. That's, that's, I think everybody, if you take this advice, you will save hundreds of thousands of dollars by the time you retire. There so, is no question. Yeah. Really appreciate that. Let me, um, I, I, I know we want to ask even more questions, so I'm going to start asking questions uh, for the Q&A box. Q &A box. Um, uh, let's see. Shika asks, per the idle, uh, idle application, we're supposed to receive 10K grant within three business days. I applied it last week, but have yet received. When should I be expecting it? Do we, do we have an SBA? I mean, uh, maybe Stephanie or someone else can. So on Tuesday, I got an email from SBA saying that anyone applying for the idle program and wanted to receive that $10,000 advance would have to uh, reapply for the advance. So if you, you applied prior to last Tuesday, you're probably going to have to submit this new application for the advance. Hmm. If you applied on Tuesday, I think you're okay. Um, there have been some delays. So there's this program called X SBA uh, Bridge Loan Express. And um, this is the loan that you would get if you want, like when you're waiting for the application for IDLE to be processed and your grant to be granted. Um, and that's a $25,000 loan. Got it. Okay. Um, so. Okay. And next question, is there still any lender take out of, take out of state income? Um, do we have lenders here? I'm, uh, Sian, I'm not so, uh, this is Trey. Um, are you talking about residential or commercial? You, you can take yourself off of the mute if you want. Trey? Okay, um, maybe we'll wait for the next one. Uh, Peter asks, appears that all banks are still working through the motions on getting loans processed. Reports are that additional stimulus is being requested or considered. Is there a specific allocation for the next tier of applicants, for example, independent contractors? If the first round runs out, do independent contractors split even a smaller pool of the stimulus? The only thing that I've heard, um, obviously, that they're, they're, they're taking another $250 billion to Congress. I, I think the latest numbers may have been $80 billion was earmarked out of the initial $350 billion tranche. Um, I know Congress is also attempting to carve out a certain portion of those funds for community banks so that the big banks don't come in and, and essentially gobble all the, all the funds up because it is a first come first serve basis. And then as far as the independent contractors, I haven't seen any communication come across with the definite rules and process and timeline, but those, will probably be coming out no later than tonight or tomorrow, considering they want to go live on Friday. Oh, interesting. Great. Um, next for, what it's worth, for what it's worth, I did read something, I think, this morning that said that um, banks are required to fund within 10 days of, of uh, application being approved. I don't know how that is enforce that. Yeah, that's initially it was five days. Now it's 10 days. Uh, we just got guidance about three hours ago to either use bank loan documents and or the, uh, the bank document provided by the SBA and the Treasury. Uh, again, that's going to be bank by bank basis. I've, you know, I can speak from my own experience. I have five that are internally approved and SBA approved with SBA numbers that they're just waiting there until we have final guidance on how to fund them. But yeah, the, the last communication we got is that we have 10 days from date of approval to fund 
but I think we have every intent of wanting to fund these things as quick as possible. We just want to make sure that we document them correctly. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, next one. What kind of tax benefit do you see government could be enrolling out in the near future to help consumers or small business owners? And I guess nobody really know, predict this right now. Well, I mean, I think they've, they've rolled out a lot already. And so they're going to have to see what the effects of, of those are going to be. Um, I could see them playing around with um, maybe allowing more to come out of their 401k, um, again, deferring uh, payments to other dates. That's, a, that's kind of an easy one because there is something embedded in the tax law that allows Treasury to actually make that call without a congressional um, mandate. That's why it was so easy for the IRS uh, to say, yeah, we'll, we'll put off you know, extensions until July 15th. So there could be another round of that, maybe, depending on how this goes. That's true. Well, one of the things that has just come down, Helen, is the thing called the CARE Act. I don't know how many are familiar with it. But referencing what Tim just said, the CARE Act basically allows a person under certain conditions, certainly if you've had the virus, it's one of the conditions, but there are other conditions available, uh, that you can pull 100,000, if you have a 401k, you can pull $100,000 out uh, there are no repayment requirements for three years. At the end of three years, if you don't pay the whole loan back, then you get an additional three years to pay it back over time. So now you can't get that money for up to six years without a governmental penalty. Obviously, it does have to be paid back eventually, but th that would certainly give people some breathing room. Great. The other one's the uh, deferral on your RMD, right? Uh, yeah, the deferral on the RMD goes to age 72. So they're gonna they're not gonna force people to start taking money out at 70 and a half. It's now age 72. Oh, oh. Okay. Right. Okay, next question. Um, Marty says, I believe the programs can be used by landlords to cover mortgage interest payments in the event tenants fail to pay. Yeah. Well, that is true. Um, if you want a hundred percent forgiveness of the loan proceeds, uh, I believe you have to demonstrate that uh, at least 75% of that went to um, payroll and payroll benefits. There is this 25% uh, leeway for the things that you just mentioned, but it is the intent is to use it for payroll. Now, if you don't want to get 100% forgiveness, then this is going to roll into a pretty decent loan, right, due in two years at a 1% interest rate. So uh, if you didn't pay it on, you know, uh, use the proceeds for that, at least you got a pretty decent loan. That's true. Yeah. That's true. All right. I never believe in stocks, but in your opinion, do you see more negative impacts to more industries and will bring the stock prices down even lower? Um, uh, yeah, I, well, I absolutely do. I mean, we're, our, our economy is trending more and more towards large corporations and more and more towards cutting out the, the small business owner. But uh, I definitely uh, would agree with that. Now, from a stock market standpoint, I can't blame somebody for saying that. If you go back to January 1st, 2000, through the close of uh, the market on March 31st, the market average returned an average rate of return of 2.7%. So that's over 21 years and averaging 2.7%, not very good by any means. But that's why uh, if you do, if you have a good advisor who can work with you, what you do want to do is stay away from advisors who basically just take your money in, throw it into a third party manager, and then they sit back and don't do anything. Uh, that's when you're really going to lose. So you either have to find somebody who's going to properly diversify you so your market, uh, market performance can do well. Um, I mean, there are programs that when I had my firm, we were averaging people 15% a year uh, and 12% a year and 8% a year in those realms. So it, it, even amongst the last 21 years. Uh, so it can be done. You just got to find the right advisor. And, uh, but I do agree with the gentleman or our lady who asked that question. Uh, there, there's going to be some stock issues along the way. It's going to take a good, Eight, uh, 18 to 24 months to kind of shake it all out. 
Uh, so we're going to see pretty volatile e uh, economic situation. I think you have to look at where's the trend right now, where's the uptrend, right? Mm -hmm. Oil is a great investment right now, oil stocks, because man, the, the cost per barrel just bottomed out with the Russia and Saudi Arabia fight. And uh, so oil stocks will rebound. Uh, when people get back in their cars and start driving more, industry gets back on. Boy, demand for oil is going to skyrocket. So if you pick certain sectors, I'm a big fan of sector investing. So, you know, real estate is a sector, oil is a sector, et cetera. And you follow the trends, you can still be very, very successful on the market. That's a great point. I mean, that kind of apply to real estate as well. We are talking about people always ask us, so is it a good time to buy real estate? Well, you need to look at the market, which market you're going into, and also what kind of asset type. Even within the asset type, for example, apartments, there's still different classes. So everything is by sector. You cannot really generalize the whole market. Exactly. And that, that's why I like rental real estate right now, because if, if taxes go back up in the future, if uh, more and more people are struggling financially, uh, uh renting renting is going to be a big deal for a lot of people who uh, can't make it work financially right um and jenny asked for investors originally thinking to 1031 and investment property but are wary about rushing into another investment property instead of 1031 exchange investors are also en uh, entertaining the idea of paying the capital gain tax i wonder if you're aware if irs is going to include a relief plan on capital gain tax Given the ups and downs of the market from the lens of financial advisor, what do you see is the safest form of investment moving forward? Is it real estate or stocks? Kind of, I guess Kurt kind of uh, answered that question, but um, Tim, can you answer the capital gains tax question? Well, I have seen nothing that would indicate that the capital gains rate is going to be changed, um, either up or down. I would say that, and, and I, Helen, you know this, I, I preach this a lot, that people need to focus on the economics of the deal and don't let the tax consequences wag the dog. And if you can take a capital gain on a particular property, not do a 1031 exchange, uh, and likely offset that with some, some losses in your portfolio, <laughs> it might be smart to do that. Um, not to mention the fact that, you know, a 1031 exchange kicks the can down the road uh, and you don't get the benefits on the uptick for the basis in cost recovery uh, when you roll that gain over into on a 1031. If you sell the property, recognize the capital gain, then use the proceeds to purchase a replacement property, now you get the stepped up basis that might actually, uh, you know, almost eliminate your gain under the favorable depreciation rules, bonus depreciation, that type of thing. So you got to run the numbers. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important to run each scenario with a CPA, right? Or um, a CCIM. Yes, or a CCIM. <laughs> Um, okay, and Marty, you said you asked what interest rate assumptions are you making for the growth? This is, I assume, is talking about Kurt's chart just now. Right. Oh, yeah. On the chart that I showed, uh, the average rate of return of the program that I illustrated has been uh, in right around the seven and a half to eight and a half percent range. Uh, but we have government regulations that prohibit you from illustrating more than a certain rate. So the rate that was illustrated on there was uh, six point nine percent. But the average return over any uh, five, ten or 20 year period in that program has been above 7%. So it's considered to be a fairly conservative rate of return. Uh, certainly it could be lower, could be 5%, it could be five and a half. Uh, I've been representing it for many, many years. Uh, ever since the index idea came out back in 1997, I started doing it in 1998. And I've yet to have a really dissatisfied customer as long as it's the right product and the right company. Great. All right, Inman just posted a news about EXP Realty laid off 15% of staff and uh, amid the market slow, a slowdown. Redfin yesterday also mentioned that they are furloughing 41% of their staff. Does that mean there will be less transaction happening in the markets? Um, any real estate professionals, realtors would like to talk about this? Uh, I, I, I can, did I hear somebody? I will say for myself, um, 
I don't think we'll be have less transaction just because, I mean, clients, consumers still need agents. We probably have less competition in a way. I mean, less realtors in the market, as um, I would think. But at the same time, consumers still need to transact. They still need to buy. They still need to sell. Um, anyone else want to make some comments about this? All right. Well, I'm not a I'm not a broker, but I continue to wonder what is going to happen to the commercial office space now that you know more than 50% of the workforce uh, has adapted to and maybe even likes working from home. Mm -hmm. um, I know that my firm in particular has five offices throughout the Bay Area. Uh, we have over 200 employees, and 100% of our workforce has been working from home. Um, and I don't think we've missed a beat. Yeah. Um, so to the extent that a firm is nimble and can, you know, reduce their overhead costs by cutting back their rent, they're going to do it. And I think this is going to have a permanent effect on commercial office space. Yeah, I absolutely. Yeah, I would, I would uh, totally agree with Tim on that. I see the same thing he does. And that's why, frankly, if you're going to go into anything other than individual single family home rentals, uh, multifamily is, is probably one of the best options you can pick because the demand for uh, rental property, I think, is going to grow. Yeah. Great. Um, I just want to mention that we are about one minute away from three. Uh, we will stay on a few more minutes to answer all the questions, uh, but I, I, I'm excited. I want to make sure that we answer all the questions available. So if you cannot stay, I definitely understand. Um, the next question is, what is his view on the current penalty wave to take out funds from 401k, invest with it, and pay back later? Is the tax spread over three years, or if repayment to 401k happens before three years, then there's not uh, there's no tax impact. That is correct. If 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 they if they borrow money out of their 401k, the, let's say a hundred thousand dollars, and they wanted to use that to buy an investment property, they could do that. Uh, three years after they they get the loan, they would be expected to pay the loan back in full. If they're not able to pull the, pay the loan back in full three years later, then they're able to set up a three-year payment plan for an additional three years but now it would be a required payment on a monthly basis mm -hmm. to where the loan would have to be paid back in full by the end of the sixth year. So there's a lot of value there because there's no tax uh, penalty. There's no uh, early withdrawal penalty. Those things are all waived. And uh, so it, it, can be, it can be a very good arbitrage uh, and way to leverage, leverage assets. Okay, Kelly asks, when should we start investing in these types of insurance? <laughs> <laughs> right away. You know, I, uh, I, I put my son and his wife into one uh, back when they were 30. Right now he's 35. He could only do $100 a month. Uh, but man, oh man, the younger you are, the more powerful the impact is. Uh, it, it, would, it will really, if you look at it, it would blow a person's mind what it will do for them. But the key is time. Frankly, you'd have to give it at least 10 years minimum, but ideally 15 years before you start accessing the tax-free cash flow. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you've got 15 years before you'd want that money, so I usually tell people age 55 or under, it's, it's a great vehicle. Uh, once you get over the age of 55, then it, ah, you know, because your, your age is older, the cost of the underlying insurance is higher, but the younger you are, the cheaper the internal cost of insurance is. So the more money that goes into the cash value and, and grows according to market conditions. I do want to call one thing out though, and that is uh, there's one company that has no cap on the earnings and that most companies will have a cap on the earnings of like 11 or 12%. So the most you can make, if the market goes up 15, you get 12. If it goes up 20, you get 12. But the, the caveat to that is, yeah, but when the market loses, you don't lose. And you and start investing from the bottom of the market to follow it back up. So it's still a fair deal. But there is one company out there. Uh, they can go to their advisor and ask about it, but it's Minnesota Life. And uh, Minnesota Life Insurance Company has no cap on the earnings. Uh, I've seen returns of anywhere from 32 to 48% in good periods. 
Wow. So uh, when you get those kind of potential returns and you can't lose on the downside, it's pretty hard to beat. Wow, amazing. Um, okay, and do, do you think they will eventually do an extension for 1031 exchange given that almost everything can be extended right now except for 1031 exchange? Um, I don't know if we have any 1031 exchange people in here to answer that question. I say no. Yeah. <laughs> I'd agree with um, you. Yeah. <laughs> Although I'm still unclear, quite honestly, how, because I think there is one situation, and I would like to hear from the 1031 people, there is one situation where if your property was in a federally declared disaster area, I thought there was the ability to extend. Well, my question is, is the entire United States a federal disaster area? <laughs> yeah. I agree. Just like um, I think the last year during the fire, that's when they were able to extend the 1031 exchange. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. The last time Wei Ming was on the call, he was a 1031 exchange expert and he he was like, yeah, we didn't hear anything yet about that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, is it true that all banks have tightened up their rules on loan processing because the bank sees the downturn on the economy? Any lenders here would like to answer that question? Ellen, I'd be happy to comment on it. It's Marty. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, Marty. Yeah, I mean, have they tightened it up? Of course they have. Um, they're also being affected by the processing of the PPP program and the EIDL program. And right now, they're like all of us. They're trying to figure out what the world's going to look like in two weeks, a year. They don't know. So what I've noticed is really good deals with really good tenants, they'll get through fine. It's anything that we might have considered a, a less than stellar loan to do, they're going to run away from that. Yeah. And until things calm down, that's just going to, you know, they have to pick and choose. And the rates have gone up as well. That's true. Does that address that? Yes, absolutely. Okay, next question. With a global shutdown and printing of trillion of dollars, how is stock still going up right now? <laughs> Where do you see our market heading after this pandemic? Well, really, the printing of dollars is much more of an inflationary situation than it is a negative impact. Ultimately, it can negatively impact the market. Uh, but I've seen plenty of times where the Federal Reserve Board is printing tons of money, uh, you know, and the market still does well. A good example of that is the early 2000s. Um, they were printing money like crazy, and yet things were still going up. And in the 90s as well, the 90s, of course, were a, a, an amazing period of time. So uh, the printing of money doesn't necessarily take away from the market. Uh, I think uh, it is true our underlying economy is pretty strong, but really anybody who tries to predict that, hey, we're going to have a great market the rest of the year, we're going to have a great market next year, I mean, they got to be crazy because how do you predict anything when there's nothing historically you can go back to to say, well, it's going to be like this. So, um, you know, but I do see the printing of the money, it's inflationary. And as I said, if we get to go from 25 trillion up to 30 trillion in debt, uh, they're gonna have to be printing a lot of money just to be able to pay their bills. And that's gonna be very inflationary. And so I think we're gonna see some interest rates. You know, anytime you see the Fed fund rate drop like it did, you know it's gonna bounce at some point in the future, it's gonna bounce and go skyrocketing up. And Marty might have a better answer on that, but I can't imagine rates staying this low forever. I think uh, the dam is gonna bust. And when it does, I didn't really see interest rates take off. So I just don't know when that would be. Thank you. And last question is from Toss B. To Kurt, do you think aviation is a good sector to invest in right now? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I do. Um, you know, there, there's one caveat in there that Tim brought up I thought was very valid. And that is we don't know the ramifications of commercial real estate and major size office buildings where everybody's being brought into a central location or even multiple locations around the country. We don't know how that's going to impact the commercial real estate market. And so companies may learn from this and say, wow, if everybody's doing all this work from home and if we can do more and more meetings via Zoom and what have you, why are we going to be throwing our, our people on planes and flying all over the country? However, having said that, I, there's still going to be a need for planes. I mean, <laughs> you know, people are going to have to be transported and travel to different locations on a regular basis. So, yeah, I think aviation right now is a good uh, purchase opportunity for the long run. You just got to make sure 
you got to follow the trend and you have to, I would wait until the trend on aviation stocks starts up. And once you see uh, at least two, two ticks up in a technical analysis chart, that's probably a good indicator that the trend is starting up again and that'd be the time to get in. Unless you put in money right now and then you're willing to sit on it. Like for example, Boeing uh, up in Washington state. I mean, I think that's a good buy, but it's gonna be a while. And now Boeing might not be as good of a buy as it used to be only because how many airlines are gonna be buying planes right now? That's true. Wow, it is true. Okay, I think we have no more questions, but um, my gosh, I really, really appreciate all of you to be here. Um, it was it was so fun to hear from different perspectives from the SBA loans, how uh, that is helping small business owners and real estate investors to the tax benefits to now the whole big picture of financial advice uh, with, this in, uh, with this index universal life policy that most people don't know about. I cannot say thank you enough for all of you to be here and all the questions being asked. And uh, again, we are doing this every week on Wednesday. And um, if, you know, Kirk, I don't mean to pull you out of retirement, but I think uh, a lot of people <laughs> are very intrigued about like what they can do. And then of course the PPP loan. Um, so we know that Vincente First Bank, they are able to take non-customers uh, uh, for the PPP loan and Tim Tukalsi, he uh, handles a lot of tax related um, related uh, questions and uh, he specializes in real estate as well. So again, um, thank you everyone until next week. I hope you guys stay healthy and safe and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.